over to Professor or Dr. Downs Martin. Uh, good evening, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Um, just a quick sound check if people can hear me. Okay, I assume the rest of you have been uh, muted. Um, I want to talk today uh, about a range of topics concerning wargaming that are usually overlooked. Uh, specifically, I want to talk also about a thought experiment called malign wargaming. Um, this talk is based on my personal professional experience. It doesn't cover all there is to know about wargaming. Okay. Uh, I am interested in your experience and knowledge, so there will be time for questions and conversation, given that we have a significant period of time this evening uh, to hold this conversation. Especially want to know where you disagree with me um, or cover different grounds. So uh, I'm going to concentrate on seminar gaming for a specific reason. And it's going to be focused on professional wargaming. And by that, I mean for the DOD. Uh, if you're not from the US, it's uh, basically professional wargaming for your own uh, military. Um, and I'm going to mostly concentrate on wargames addressing analytic questions. Uh, what I am going to talk about does apply to education and training, um, but not uh, primarily so. Um, the reason I'm going to concentrate on, well, let's just move ahead to one, one more slide. I've got this attitude. All war games uh, produce information that informs a decision maker. It informs a decision maker's decision. Up there is a table that I've drawn on from uh, Yuna Wong, uh, Sebastian Bay, Ellie Bartels, and I don't know Mr. Smith's or Dr. Smith's first name there from the paper Next Generation War Game for US Marine Corps. Uh, Una and Co. broke wargaming down into a bunch of different purposes on the left hand column. And I filled out some of the cells here with examples of alternatives that are being gamed the narrative based evidence that the war game produces and some of the example decisions that they inform. So all war games inform decisions, even educational ones. At the very least, they inform the decision about whether or not a student has learned, uh, whether or not the student should get a uh, educational qualification. The same with training, experiential and socialization, what has been shared, operational plans, decisions, and concepts and technology development uh, is pretty obvious. Okay, so purpose all war games inform decisions. Um, why am I focused on seminar games? It's because seminar, it, it, the kind of games that I've been dealing with. Uh, they deal with senior officers who are playing and uh, serious analytic problems. Most senior officers are not gamers. Their patience for learning a bunch of game rules is very limited. Even if you can get them around a board, and you usually can because they're used to working with maps. They're used to working with icons on maps, so chips that you move about the board. Uh, even if you do that, they revert back to what they do in their daytime jobs, which is discuss, argue, look at alternatives, and give orders. So in most of the games I've dealt with at the War College, Senior officers turn up and the game construct, the game-like construct is hidden from them, usually in the uh, adjudication cell, okay? So there's a lot of discussion. The games are in fact discussion-based, okay? Um, especially those that are designed to explore novel future situations, okay? In that case, you almost required a seminar style game construct. And I include matrix games in that because you, because it's novel and future, you don't actually have combat results tables or adjudication rules. 
Okay, the, dis the game is actually designed to come up with some understanding of the future. The game is actually designed, or the purpose of the game, is to understand what the combat results tables, the adjudication methods of a game that dealt with that situation should be. It's a chicken and egg problem, really. Okay, and so for those two reasons, for the attempts to look into the future, future novel situations, and because most senior officers are not gamers, we hope that changes in the future as we train and educate junior officers. But frankly, we're not there yet. Uh, I'm going to look at seminar uh, style gaming. What we should now look at is the inner game and the outer game of a war game. When we talk about war gaming, we tend to think about what I call the inner game there in red, center slightly below the uh, in the middle. That's the war game. And as I've pointed out, the games of interest that I'm talking about are seminar based, discussion based. But there's an entire outer game and it is a game with moves and players. The sponsor is a player. The war game designer is a player. If you're not careful, some of the senior war game players that are in your inner game are also making moves in your outer game and you have other stakeholders. Okay. And they start playing this game, the outer game, when a decision is required and a problem stated, then you move into sponsor discussions and moves in this game take place around the sponsor discussions. The game design is part, is a phase in the game, not a move in the game, it's a phase. And during the game design, there are moves. There are outer game moves taking place during the inner game. Analysis is a phase and there's moves taking place there. How the report is written, how accurate it is, how it's nuanced, how the analysis is interpreted, and then you move on to the decision. The victory conditions of the outer game are reputations, dollars and careers at the personal level, and the purpose of the outer game is to inform a national security decision. So now we'll come on to malign wargaming. And here you have uh, my, my uh, schizophrenic characters here, Saintly Stephen, which is uh, rarely happens, but sometimes, and Demonic Stephen. Um, the whole purpose of this thought experiment was driven by my uh, understanding of you know, best practices for war games. And long ago, I, uh, I came across a museum. It was a museum of bad art. That doesn't mean incompetent art. These were carefully curated pieces that epitomized bad art of various kinds. And it dawned on me that if we only look at best practices, after action reviews, uh, how do we do things right, what mistakes to avoid, we're only looking at one side of the coin. I had a hypothesis that if we were to put it, give, have the thought experiment by which we deliberately attempted to design a game that whose purpose was to deceive the sponsor into making a decision that was not the best one for national security and which the intelligent sponsor, the intelligent sponsor uh, bought into. Okay, not just lying and not deceiving a dim witted sponsor, but a game that is genuinely malign. It gives you uh, malign information, but appears to be good. Okay, that by doing that, we may come up uh, with other best practices we wouldn't come up with. Uh, by only looking at well attempts to design games properly, it would also provide us with uh, an understanding of what techniques people might be deliberately actually doing to subvert a game and allow us to inoculate ourselves against that. A boss at one point said to me when I explained this to him, I cannot imagine military officers deliberately doing that, Stephen. 
And then he paused and he said, well, I could imagine contractors doing it. My response to him was two words, Fat Leonard. How many admirals, how many senior officers are currently being investigated for selling their country for sex and booze? Sir, uh, he kind of backed down after that. So I think this is a, uh, a valid uh, thought experiment and it certainly gives you, uh, it has, has given us interesting insights into how we, what we should be doing when there are billions of dollars of program money uh, involved in programs that, uh, within the DOD and the industry, defense industry, the idea that everyone present is deliberately on, is avoiding being deliberately dishonest is naive. Uh, the idea that we are not self-deluded into doing things that give us preferred answers, but not necessarily uh, ones that are objectively well justified is, is naive at best. So we need to ask ourselves, how do we do this um, without being uh, called out? Okay, so let's go to uh, an interesting book on fact and fraud by David Goodstein, uh, Vice Provost of Caltech at one point. His job was to look into scientific fraud inside the uh, university system. Huge amounts of research dollars at risk, uh, significant reputation, and so on. And he found that in nearly all cases of scientific fraud, those three risk factors were present. Okay, take a couple of moments and look at those. And it dawned on me that all of those were present among senior military officers and senior executive civil servants. Okay, they're all present. How many, uh, not all present all the time, my apologies. Uh, most of the time, more than one of them is present. Let me caveat it like that. Military, senior military officers are not renowned for their shyness and their uncertainty. So number one is usually a check. Frequently, frequently in uh, wargaming, the sponsor starts out by asking us, game that this is true. The objective is to show this is true in a game. The sponsor already thinks they know the answer. Uh, that just goes on all the time. Uh, I sat and listened to the Air Force generals tell us on one game that they th their interest was to, was to show that, air, that some air platform would dominate the battlefield. And when I suggested that what they really should be looking at is under what conditions would it not dominate the battlefield, uh, they took their toys and went away. They already had the answer, weren't interested in having it challenged. Under career pressure, many officers at the Pentagon, their job is to make their flag or general officer's program work so their flag or general officer looks good. And so they are under career pressure. Junior officers during a game have senior officers peering over their shoulder, wanting to know why they lost the aircraft carrier, for example. And third, that one working in a field where individual experiments are not expected to be precisely reproducible, um, what war, what battle is precisely reproducible? So they're all present in any serious war game dealing with a serious problem. So we must assume at best that at best, the malign behavior will be inadvertent and at worst, it will be deliberate, okay? So let's just look at the inner game for a moment, a seminar-based game. We start off with the design, we play the game. Towards the end of the game, a meeting occurs amongst the adjudicators, facilitators, and game director to plan the plenary, the final plenary. You have the final plenary. You have an after action review, do analysis, report to the sponsor. Now the malign player who understands group dynamics and human psychology, and I'm gonna go through the red and blue moves for manipulating this process. The malign player participates in and observes those first two points, the play and the planning meeting. 
And then the malign player is able to corrupt the final plenary and the after action review and manipulate the outbrief to the sponsor. And we all know the sponsor wants the outbrief within either on the last day of the one week game or within a few days after that. And when a month later you've done a proper deep analysis, that report simply won't matter. I've watched the senior three-star general, sorry, uh, flag officer, three-star flag officer sponsoring a game, take the get out brief from his senior captains before the game was over. We could, we, you know, we wrote the report, but what was the point? Um, and he received his report from his senior captains and I could have written what he got before the game even played because I knew what the going in position was. And guess what? It was their reported position when they were, uh, when they were briefing the, uh, their admiral. Now, that goes on inside the inner game. I've already walked you through some of the outer game opportunities for manipulating the game design. The conferences with the sponsor, the meetings with senior officers who are going to lead your cells, okay, uh, uh, and so on. Now we'll come on to the actual physical moves that red and blue uh, participate in. Um, any questions here? Anyone want? Yes, sir, we had a couple we had a couple questions come in, sir. And okay. they're kind of related into one. So I'm gonna to take to you. One of them was an observation related to you, kind of assimilating your experience. And so really the singular question is these multiple risk factors are kind of observed and have seen and are well known. What impact do these does this have on either gaining or retaining a talent pool for those analytical gamers? And and what impact does it have on the service and the profession of analytical gaming? So the, by the, you mean the entire uh, risk of uh, malign gaming or the risks, those, the three risk factors that the University of Caltech came up with? I think those three serve as a you know, vehicle and a way of yeah. articulating yeah. the problem. I, I, I think actually they have little effect because most people are unaware of them explicitly. Um, there's this... I mean, people argue and complain about sponsors, game players, ga game players complain about the design. Everyone complains about everybody and, and we just get on with it. Um, I think the effects, uh, the major effects are less on retaining talent at the analytic level or at the game player level, at the game design level than they are on our national security. There, I think it's, uh, that it's quite significant because we end up with games that uh, are not honest. And people, are, uh, you know, most people are unaware they're not honest. They think they've taken account of the dishonesty of those risk factors. They think they've taken those risk factors into account and they haven't. That probably hasn't answered the question to the people who've asked its satisfaction. So. Uh, bang into chat everybody you know whatever clarification you want to make about the question and we can get, circle back to that the original question asker did it clarify they said they have particularly avoided analytical gaming and have self-selected towards educational war gaming out of concern ah, ah i see what you're saying yes um uh the the risks well are the risks less you can manipulate an educational game using the techniques I'm going to discuss. And what's the risk of having an officer who believes he or she is properly educated, but isn't, and whose superiors promote that person believing they're properly educated, but they're not? I know we all promised not to talk about this last week that's gone by, but I would suggest that a certain lack of leadership based on past training and education and experience comes to play in what we've seen recently in the last few days. And if any of that education and training was done by wargaming, we have to put our hands up and say we're partly to blame. Yes, sir. And then a related question to kind of even what you were moving into, what impact could this have on just the wider field of wargaming beyond just the games that those malign actors had participated in? 
I think if we as war gamers properly understand the you know dynamics of this kind of game, we can do them properly. We can educate our sponsors and our players. We can highlight when people are attempting to manipulate them, and they will through um, they may be well intentioned, and so the broader impact, the better war games. We face a problem right now. It's not a lack of interest in war games, at least at the lower uh, levels. There seems to be a lot of interest in war games. Very senior officers, however, do, do not appear to be interested in you know, paying a lot of attention to war games. Um, I'm not sure if that's true. Uh, it does seem to be true to me. Even if they are paying attention to war games, um, are they giving it, are, they, are those war games properly constructed and are they giving those war games uh, due attention? A lot has been talked about recently about gaming pandemics before the current pandemic hit. Um, in a sense, we did. We did game the pandemics. We gamed them well. Uh, there were plans based on those games and the political system uh, just blew right past them. And that, I think, is because we failed to game. We failed to game how our political infrastructure would actually deal with information. Um, this is a failure in my view, and I'm going to go uh, behind the scenes here. This is a failure in my view to do consultative selling. We've done war gaming for a couple of hundred years now. Shame on us if we don't know how to do it properly, okay? We need, I believe, to stop spending time inventing more clever game mechanics to handle novel situations like cyber and spend a little more time worrying about how do we sell gaming to the sponsors. Now, that sounds odd because the sponsors come to us, don't they? And they ask for a game, so we don't need to sell it to them. No, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about selling the idea that the sponsor takes the game output seriously. And when it's at the political level, that means the politicians take the game output so seriously, they understand that to go against the game will damage them politically in the future. If the game doesn't impact the decision-making calculus of the sponsor or the political leadership, the game was pointless. Doesn't matter how true it was or how valuable or accurate or whatever, valid or whatever other word, adjectives, you know, nice adjectives you want to apply. If it doesn't impact the decision-making calculus, it's pointless. So we have to, the first step is ensuring that the games are actually honest, that the sponsor has a reason to take them seriously and worry that by going against the outcome of the game, they are going to risk damaging their political futures. So unless you want to stop me, I'm going to move on. Right, so let's look at some of the uh, some of the actual moves. This one, hmm, let's see, why didn't it move? Oh, uh, there we go. So I noticed long ago, because someone pointed out to me in another life, that in any large meeting, and we've all been at meetings like this, come down to the Pentagon, and we're going to uh, brainstorm. And I went to one at the, at the Giedo office, 60 people in a brainstorm. We're going to brainstorm solving a problem. Uh, we're going to discuss a problem. Um, I noticed it really didn't matter the format or the, how large the size was. And I suggest you do this for yourselves. Uh, and I've done it for the last 20 odd years. Count how many people in the room make a substantial contribution. It's about eight. And there's a quite significant drop off after eight. Two or three might throw the odd comment in. The meeting goes on long enough that eights will shift to another eight, perhaps overlapping. 
because the meeting topic has changed. And it just means you've had two back-to-back -back meetings with the same group of people in the room. Um, but it's about eight people. It's literally only about eight people. So how would you use this? Okay. Um, the first thing I would do if I wanted to manipulate the outcome of any discussion, this can be a discussion with a sponsor where we're trying to understand what are the requirements for the game. It can be a discussion internally about uh, the game design. It can be a game cell having a discussion about what color to cover. It can be the after action review. It, it can be anything. Um, and by the way, all of these techniques are applicable to any other activity that surrounds analysis or inquiry. Um, no analysis takes place, or very few, by one person going off, thinking hard, coming back with the answer. Discussion occurs. Uh, I would do the following. I would invite, be inclusive. Inclusive is a popular word right now. I would be inclusive. I would invite everybody I possibly could, especially people who didn't agree with me, right? I would then recruit my buddies, my seven or eight buddies who agree with me. And before the meeting, we'd have a get together and I would uh, brief them and give them their orders. And what they would do is speak up early and forcefully, all of them, in support of whatever our position was. The likelihood that others would speak up after those eight had already spoken is low. Okay, it's low. Now, obviously, you have to pay attention to really contentious issues. Um, the, the best way of doing this isn't to be really blunt and outrageous, but to just have your eight people uh, speak early and often and nudge the conversation down the road to, towards uh, accepting your preferred uh, conclusion from whatever is the objective of this meeting, okay? That's the, uh, that's the red move, if you like. Um, at the Jaedo meeting I went to, uh, there was about 60 people, a huge brainstorm. Seeing, uh, the colonel would cut us off after a few minutes of discussion on any topic and move us along. Uh, the usual about eight people uh, were talking. And I thought to myself at the time, my God, this is incompetent. And then I realized, no, this is brilliant. This is absolutely brilliant. The Jaedo at that point, 10 years ago, had spent, I don't know, billions, was the figure that was being banded about, failing to uh, solve the problem. So they had this three-day meeting of industry and all sorts of experts to come in and help them deal with it. It dawned on me, what was the motive? Did they really want, after spending a billion dollars, to have a three-day meeting of civilian outsiders solve the problem for them? What would that say about them? It dawned on me that a good hypothesis is the meeting was deliberately designed to uh, not come to a conclusion. I'm not saying it was designed that way. I'm just saying the hypothesis was credible. So. You're blue and you've been pushed into some meeting that your boss has told you to run and has invited all sorts of people. Uh, what do you do? Well, it's obvious you break everybody up into groups of eight, into subgroups of eight, right? That's your uh, counter move. Everybody into subgroups of eight. You distribute, you either have them address the same question in parallel or you have them uh, address different questions or different topics and uh, have a, 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 you know, multiple issues dis uh, discussed at the same time. I'll talk a little bit about how you construct those groups of eight uh, later uh, and how red's counter move can subvert this blue move, okay? So, a, a deeper, a, a more specific way of holding these meetings is the, the brainstorm. So back to the brainstorm. The um, problem with brainstorming, it was introduced, the, it, the part, it's a very popular method, unfortunately. Introduced in the 50s, the claim was made that, you know, brainstorming without analysis generates lots of good ideas. 
uh, and it's a good way of doing business. And at the time, social scientists said, well, that's an interesting hypothesis. We can test that. And they did. And they demonstrated it was not a particularly good way of doing business. The three phase normative process is much better. And in fact, that experiment is so easy to do that it features in most first year social science university courses. Uh, you go and you look online and do a search for the brainstorming myth and uh, you'll be inundated in literature about this. Uh, it is the lazy, ignorant person's approach to running a meeting. And I won't back off from that statement. Ask yourself, how, many, how long did any brainstorm meeting last that you've been in? And by that, I mean before the first piece of analysis kicked in, before the senior general in the room, or senior officer in the room, grunted approval or disapproval as an idea, because at that point, the brainstorm is over. I give most meeting brainstorms about two minutes. None of the problems I'm mentioning are incurable by damn good facilitation. But how often do we see that occurring? So again, again, what's the red move? You, you recruit your eight people and you have them express approval and disapproval early and often, okay? Um, doing that kind of nudges people into not wanting to express support for the uh, what's been the bad idea or support for the good one. If you can get a senior officer in there um, um, who agrees with your idea, you don't have to be explicit. We're going to corrupt this meeting, sir. You can just brief him before going in saying th these are the topics and I'm, I I'm terribly afraid, sir, that they're going to support this idea. Oh, I don't like the idea of that. Well, there you go, uh, General. Anyway, let's see what happens. You can recruit these people without realizing you're recruiting them, okay? Um, and of course, the blue move is, again, break them into group, subgroups of eight. But this time, you reintroduce the idea of the three-stage normative process. Uh, the experiments distinctly showed this is superior. You get better ideas and more, better, and more of them. You initially have your group write down their three ideas or three answers to the question silently without discussion. They're, they if they're not expert, they shouldn't be around the table. That's the first part issue. So have them do it silently so they're not influencing each other and no one can jump in and dominate and influence how the discussion proceeds. Then you, that's the first green bucket. Then you lay the ideas on the table and you have a discussion about them. And then after that, there's a silence period where you think about what ideas, additional ideas have come up and you write those down. Then you collect all those together. The experiments have shown consistently that doing that vice just going in, having a brainstorm and writing the ideas down gets you better and more ideas, okay? Um, there's no excuse, absolutely none, not to use this. And you can do it if you've only got eight people in the room. That's you do the three stage normative process anyway. OK. So talked about that. Now let's look at wisdom of crowds. OK, the um, idea behind, you know, it's, it's, wisdom of crowds that's promoted by people who don't know what they're talking about is, well, you know, you just get all these people in the room, Stephen, and, you know, we'll have this discussion and, you know, wisdom comes out of it. Um, it is an idiotic idea to think that a large group of idiots can come up with better ideas than a single expert, or a group of expert sanitation engineers can come up with a better uh, medical procedure than an oncology expert. OK, the wisdom of a crowds requires those four uh, criteria to be true before you get the wisdom instead of the madness of mobs. You have to have opinion diversity. OK, each person should have private information, even if it's just an eccentric interpretation of the known facts. You have to have opinion independence. 
They're not determined by the opinions of those around them. You need decentralization. They're able to specialize and draw on local knowledge and come last to the decision aggregation. There has to be a mechanism for turning private judgments into an objective collective, rather, sorry, a collective decision. Um, top left, we have an interesting example of wisdom of crowds. And the two bottom one are madness of mobs. Don't tell me the two bottom images are giving you uh, wisdom just because there's a crowd there. Bottom right, just in case any of you are unaware, is I believe the South Korean parliament. Okay, quite extraordinary. Um, what's going on there is not what it looks like. It looks like a rampaging, thuggery punch up. Um, I listened to an interview with one of them and he explains, no, no, you don't understand. Our constituents expects us to fight for them and they mean fight. So we have, we have these, you know, uh, staged fights and sometimes people get excited, but there you are. So what are the malign moves here? Okay. The malign move is basically four of them. You are going to break the four requirements, okay? You're gonna break them. Um, you select senior people with opinions you prefer and add in expert juniors. That's the, uh, that's the people you invite to your crowd, okay? Um, you allow undisciplined brainstorming, okay? You poll the group sequentially, starting with the seniors. Okay. The absolutely, the, you know, there's incompetence or malice afoot when people are asked to vote publicly. Okay. Especially if they're asked to vote sequentially, they make their vote and then their votes are turned over. Okay. Um, you use junk arithmetic to do the aggregation. Um, you know, Everyone's voted. The senior officers have voted first. The juniors have voted second. Um, the, you know, it could be a prioritization of a list of requirements. And then you use rank ordering and add up the rank orders or some other bogus approach. Um, and that entire method there, you have a range of possibilities for convincing people. I have an objective method, sir, for handling uh, to doing, you know, getting arithmetic certitude for your decision. I teach entire courses on how to manipulate that without the uh, sponsor knowing that's what's happening to him. The end of which you claim the wisdom of crowds um, to justify everything and make everyone feel good. So that's the red, blue, okay? You recruit, you recruit your members of your meetings uh, to satisfy opinion diversity and decentralization. You ensure independence of opinion by using a three-stage normative process I briefly described. And you do not use numeric approaches to rank order or uh, score what are subjective professional issues. Use a narrative advantages, disadvantages matrix. We use numeric voting methods to try and ensure a violence-free transition of power when millions of people are voting. Um, it's, a, it's not an analytic technique whatsoever. It just isn't. Okay, so that's, that's that. Now let's move to, oh, any questions at this point? Let's, let's just grab questions. Yes, sir, we have quite a, we have a couple. Um, okay. <clears throat> the first category is still kind of relating to the behavior and impact of the malign actors. So the first one was, do malign actors in educational wargaming, as opposed to analytical, use different influence styles to steer the audience to preconceived conclusions or formed ideas? Yes. Um, if it's an analytic game, they're more focused, okay, on the uh, setting up the question, questions at the beginning and the in the analysis and reporting phase, um, in, in, in my opinion. Um, but I don't see any particular advantage uh, of doing that. Um, 
frankly. Uh, for education, it, so remind me, it's uh, you're comparing, contrasting rather, analytic games and training and education games. Is that the question? Yeah, the question was, I believe the person who asked the question has, it sounds like a background in educational wargaming. And so they're looking for, is there different techniques or I'm right. assuming here that this is yeah. the line of the questioning. So this is Sebastian's question, I'm guessing, but maybe not there. Are, I know um, Pigeon is on the line as well here. He's an educator and trainer. Um, it all It's the objective, isn't it? Who are you trying to, uh, who are you trying to influence? Uh, analytic game, I have a specific decision that's being informed for the but uh, for the analysis, you know, that the game has been sponsored for. Um, for an educational game, it may be a, a one that's run routinely and repeatedly. Um, I suspect there's less motive for malignity in the educational gaming. That's a suspicion of mine. Um, what benefit? I mean, the only benefit the educator gets, I suppose, in being malignant is in having more people come out of the game, you know, with grade A's uh, than grade C's. Um, so, you know, that's my first observation about education games. Um, it, they're open to malign uh, behavior, but I don't believe the motivation to do so is great as, as great there. But what motivation there might be is having your seminar group do better than the seminar group of uh, the other professor. Um, but if they're both playing the same game with the same game design, uh, I find it hard to see how you would uh, how you would do that. So I, I find it hard to see how one would be motivated to malignly manipulate a educational game, frankly. Um, training, you might be motivated to make some senior officer look good by your game, uh, by your game design. I could see a war game uh, organization inadvertently or deliberately designing its training program to be successful so it can sell more of them. And that means making it look as though the officers who go through it did really well, right? And so that means manipulating, manipulating the scenario to fit the, what you know about those officers' backgrounds, so they are less likely to be surprised and discomforted and put out, have to think outside the box. I could see that happening, especially if there's a lot of money, consulting money involved. Yes, sir, thank you. The next question, I, I think this was asked before we started transitioning to this, but uh, does Malign, is there, an overarching or category where malign behaviors are identified and addressed in a professional and cooperative manner. So I know we're looking at these malign behaviors, but is there a, a way to identify these clearly and then address them in a cooperative manner to for the benefit of future generations and professional wargamers? Well, I, I, yes. Uh, in my view, the first phase is to have your game, uh, your wargame design peer reviewed by a sister organization. Okay. Um, and by that, I mean it's it's everything. It's not just the war, it's not just the game book with how many game cells you have, et cetera, et cetera. That's the inner game design. But the entire game process should be uh, reviewed um, at best, you know, at worst after the event, at best, you want a uh, an observer from a sister organization. Uh, right in at the beginning, looking at how you're putting together them, starting with the first meeting with the sponsor. Um, the, at the War College for a while, uh, while I was there, uh, we had a policy. The sponsor would send a game requirement to us, and up to that point, we had a habit of snapping to attention and saying, yes, sir, you know, what would you like the game result to be? Um, we changed the policy. Uh, and to, I'll give you a description uh, of how this played out on one particular occasion. Uh, got, got a call, we want a game, 
this is the objective, yada, yada, yada. When can you start? Uh, okay, well, let me run it up our chain of command and put it in the, uh, make sure we, we start the planning process for the facility. Meanwhile, I need to come down and talk to your flag officer uh, to, you know, basically walk through what is he, what, what is it he really wants? Why does he want it? Why doesn't he have it? The three questions I always ask. There's a fourth question, how long are you in your current position, sir? And you'll understand immediately why you ask that question. So, you know, there's a bit of humming and hawing, and the staff agreed I could go down there. So went down and they met me and said, well, the Admiral's kind of busy, but we'll tell you what he wants and why he wants it. So, well, okay. Uh, you know, they brought out the sort of 58 slide death by PowerPoint briefing and walked me through it. I said, okay, that's very interesting. That's given me some additional information. Well, when can you start? I can start when I've had 30 to 45 minutes of your Admiral's time. Let me know when that's going to happen. And went back to the War College. And they were really pissed. But eventually, you know, came back about a week later and said, well, we've arranged the meeting with the Admiral. Excellent. Thank you very much. Went up there. My boss came with me at that point because he was worried. Um, <laughs> he was worried about me, not for me, about me. And we sat down and the Admiral came in and the temperature was icy. The staff all sat around the back, the edge of the room, glaring at me with their binders of PowerPoint. The Admiral sat down and said, well, OK, uh, Doctor, I don't know why I'm here, really. My staff have told you what I want. Um, how do you want to run this? I said, well, the reason I'm talking to you is on occasion, we've discovered that the objective provided by the staff isn't the objective that the sponsor actually wants. And when that happens and we go ahead, you know, things go bad and the temperature dropped further. And so we walked through the process. What is it you actually want? Well, I've told you, well, okay, let me write that down. And why do you want this? And we walked through and I kept feeding back. Okay, see so what you're telling me, what you're telling me. And I would intersperse it with, and what you're telling me is, and I fed him back what his staff had told me was his number one priority. And on about the third time I fed him that, his patience snapped. You're not listening to me, Stephen. I'm not interested in that. And my response was that, that's interesting because that is what your staff have told me is your number one priority, sir. And uh, we moved on from there. Now, it turned out that that was his number one priority. We designed again. But my fourth question, how long are you going to be here, sir? Well, it turned out to be four months, but he assured me his replacement was on board. And his replacement probably was on board, but his staff managed to kill that project before his staff actually came on board. So right at the beginning, right at the beginning, what is the process you're using to design the game? It starts with the first conversation with the sponsor. And it ends when you debrief the sponsor on the game results based on the analysis and the report. And every phase of that has to be addressed. We could have gone ahead, okay, without that phase, that first phase. That would be a bad game design decision, open to malignant manipulation, okay? I and the staff could have been in cahoots. Um, we'd have gone through. The game uh, would not have really addressed the sponsor's requirements. The results would have been given back to the staff after that uh, uh, admiral had left. You know, um, if the uh, if people didn't like those game results, they could have pointed justifiably the finger back at the war game designers for ha not having done their job properly, or just moved on because it's an embarrassment to have done a game and they're expensive uh, without it uh, being done properly. So the number one uh, issue for this is peer review, peer review. And you know, at each stage of this process, you do it properly. You have to pay attention. War game education, Sebastian, has to include group dynamics, psychology, deception, uh, you know, corruption, all these uh, issues that people are subject to.
Yes, sir. Thank you. That was incredibly detailed. Um, kind of related somewhat to that. Um, <clears throat> is do, do malign actors, I apologize, kind of like there, do, do malign actors resist some of the relevant arguments or like an example would be instead of recording dissent in like the whiteboard or like a parking lot, they come up with insightful abilities to stay on their desired end state in the desired conclusion. Oh, oh yes, of course. I mean, this is a game, remember, between the malign actor and the, uh, and, and between blue and red. This is a game. They're not going to just give up. So, you know, the malign, the malign actor is not going to stand up and say, I'm deliberately trying to manipulate the system, Stephen. Uh, you know, you, you, you spot malign actors by their behavior, and it may be that they're being inadvertently malign. It may be they're just incompetent. Wisdom of crowds, let's invite everybody. But everybody tends to be from their community. And so, you know, they're packing the, uh, they're packing the ballot box, so to speak. They could be doing that inadvertently or deliberately. But the malign actor does it deliberately. You break them up into groups of eight, and I'm now going to move on to the counter move to you breaking them up into groups of eight with a normative process. I can manipulate that one too. So, and the game doesn't end until the game's over. Okay. Yes, sir. There, were, there are two relating questions that it sounds like you're about to address. And the last question, I apologize for my son in the background. Uh, can you just please explain what the three stage normative process is? Yes. Yes, I can. So, um, they did the experiments, okay, brainstorm. Uh, we'll give a group, and there was, they did the experiment properly, okay, uh, groups of people from the same communities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you give a group of people, they're experts on the topic, a, a problem to brainstorm about. They brainstorm. They write their ideas down, and, and you facilitate it. You do the brainstorm properly. I'm not talking about the one that breaks in, in, in 120 seconds. You do it properly. And it's a good brainstorm and they've got the ideas right down in front of them. Uh, elsewhere, you have another group of people and they're roughly the same kind of demographics, et cetera. And you send them the question ahead of time or you give it to them as they walk in the door and tell them to be quiet. And you ask them, think about this and answer the question or address the topic with three uh, responses. I give them yellow stickies so they can't write essays on the subject, you know. Uh, but think about it and give three responses. If you've got 12 responses, give me your top three. There's another, there's eight other, seven other people in the room. The likelihood that, you know, you've got 20 topics that no one else has thought about is really low. So give us the top three. You then, that's phase one, okay? You can do that like, the two weeks ahead of the meeting or as they walk in i've done it as they walk in i've got a two-hour meeting they walk in the first 10 minutes okay you're all experts on this topic you knew this was the topic that was going to be addressed sir here's your pack of yellow stickies write down your top three responses 10 minutes later you post those all on the whiteboard then you have the discussion about those topics and there's an entire process for that called language processing it's like a root canal. People don't like it, but it gives you really good results. You go back and uh, pull out, you know, I, what, what, what ideas were missing here that you really want to put back on the table? Because, you know, we don't want to go over a lot of repeated ideas. They go on the table. Third stage is, okay, go away, think about this, and whatever ideas suddenly get generated as a result of your meeting, mail them in or you send them away for 10 minutes and have them think if you don't have time and collect them. What they've found is you now have those two approaches, brainstorming, doing it one, doing it one with brainstorming, does another way with uh, three stage. Three stage tends to be longer, but not wildly longer. You can do it in a, a you can do an hour three stage if you're really disciplined. Um, you have a third group of similar experts who are familiar with the topic, and they assess, the qu without knowing which group the two buckets of ideas are coming from. They're given two buckets of ideas and said, which bucket has better ideas and more of them? And 
they routinely, systematically, when you do this experiment, the three-stage normative process, the initial ideas are better, the ideas at the end of stage two are better, and the ideas at the end of stage three, all three are better at any, any of those three, but especially all three added up, are better than what comes out of a brainstorm. Not every time, but systematically and most of the time. Okay, it's laziness to we'll all get together and have a brainstorm. It's just sheer unprofessional laziness. Well, ignorance, ignorance. Someone hasn't read the literature from 19, mid 50s to now, 70 years. You know, some people, it takes a while for them to catch up. Next question. All right, I'll roll forward. So two more issues that are particularly interesting. Let's see if I can get my machine to wake up. There we go. Okay, dishonesty shift. This cartoon gets it wrong, okay? It's a great cartoon, isn't it? All those in favor say aye. They all say aye, and they're all, yeah, you've got to be kidding me. Nah, that's not what actually happens. What they've found is that this, there's a strong inclination. Let me just turn off my video. There's a strong tendency, okay, for to behave immorally in groups than individually. There's a strong tendency for a group to make decisions that are supported by individuals after the group decision has been made, than those that there are more immoral than those individuals would have made if left to themselves. And the experiments all show it's the group discussion that does it. It's an inherent uh, characteristic of small group discussions. And what's going on is that the individual um, the individual's point at which they pull back and say, I've, I'm stepping over the ethical line is stretched without them realizing it. And you can stretch it more by emphasizing things like doing, making the hard decision uh, to, get, to gain the benefit by stressing the risk of not making the decision, by getting people semi-panicked into what happens if we don't actually solve this problem. They're more willing. And furthermore, that dishonesty shift persists in the individual about the topic after the decision has been made, okay? So your malign move, your malign move is to basically try and break. If you, if you want a really immoral decision being made, okay, you try and break it up into a sequence of decisions, each one of which nudges the group further and further down an immoral route, an unethical route, okay? You emphasize the threat driving the need for a decision, and you emphasize you make the hard decisions for the greater good. Um, it's actually quite easy to avoid this, but you have to do it explicitly. Um, at the beginning of every meeting, of every discussion, you remind the group, okay, about the ethical standards required of the group, about the ethical norms. This has been proven to work, but you have to do it at the beginning of every meeting because every meeting starts with this new threat, this new hard decision to, to make, okay? And the second issue, the second technique is in the group, you have a name in your eight person group, you've broken them up into eight. You have the names, you have a named individual in charge who is accountable for the subgroups, for that group's decision is held accountable for the ethics of the decision and the efficacy of the decision. That guy or gal is going to really pay attention and balance ethics with, with uh, efficacy. Now, we all know at the War Colleges, you're taught about ethics and taught about whether a decision uh, is feasible, uh, et cetera, um, from both a practical and ethical point of view. But people are people. You get them into a, a small group, 
uh, with an exciting hard decision to make with a real poor downside of getting it wrong or doing nothing and uh, all sorts of things can go on. Um, Ed, there looks like there's someone in the waiting room. I'll let you decide whether you let He's coming in right now, sir. Okay. So the next one is what's called a risky shift. Okay. Um, people's decision that come out of small groups, their risk tolerance changes as a result of the dis discussion, vice having to just make a decision without discussion. And that risk shift is systematic. OK, first of all, it depends on who suffers the consequences of your decision. People are, are, are different, have different risk aversion or risk seeking behavior, depending on whether it's them, people they know or people they don't know. OK, what tends to happen is that risk preferences are attenuated when making decisions for other people. This is a tendency, not true of everyone. Risk averse participants take more risk for others, whereas risk seeking participants take less. So they sort of go more to the sort of neutral level when it's making decisions for other people. And good leaders tend to be risk neutral. And by risk neutral, I mean, they don't overemphasize the gains to be made from a particular COA, nor do they overemphasize the likelihood or unlikelihood of achieving that course of action. Okay, they're, kind of, they're risk neutral. People have done experiments with, uh, with, by experiments, I mean, they've, you know, gathered the data and done the analysis on decision making that involves, say, cash. Uh, traders on the stock market, uh, baseball card trading. And by the way, if you think baseball card trading is uh, trivial, the most expensive baseball cards sold on the market went for somewhere between four and a half and five and a half million dollars each card. People who trade, if they're unsuccessful, they tend to leave. So you end up eventually with mostly successful traders. And when you look at their trading behavior, that trading behavior tends to be risk neutral. They're not uh, going for the glory. They're not uh, risk averse. They're risk neutral. So good leaders tend to be risk neutral. The malign move here, and it does require you to really understand who you are inviting to your game. You isolate risk neutral or good leaders into some sort of high level uh, gray beards advisory group in another room and their job is to sort of look at the game the results and discuss amongst themselves and come up with strategic ideas about this operational game i've seen it done i've absolutely seen this done put all the guys who might interfere with your game because they're senior in their own room pander to their egos tell them they're discussing Information is all one way from the game to them and never the other direction. That stops them using their leadership knowledge and experience from noticing that the game basically has been manipulated. OK, and give in the main group back in the game or your analysis group, give speaking preferences to participants whose risk profile is advantageous to you. Most of the games we're doing, OK, the outcomes are not going to influence the people uh, that they, these people know. If it's an analytic game about which platform you're going to buy, that platform's not going to be in position for years. Okay, The people playing the game, helping make the decision, don't know the people who are going to be involved. There's an exception there. I'm just checking the time here. Exception there. I was at part of a, of a game and an uh, analysis and discussions to look at the uh, platform requirements, the requirements for a platform that was going to replace a particular platform. And everyone in the room were operators. They were pilots of that platform. I could have written down, in fact, I did, the uh, requirements they were going to come up with because it was, I guessed that they really, I mean, just through sheer 
professional um, uh, knowledge, their own uh, experience and what they were they'd, they were used to, the requirements are going to look very much like the requirements of the current systems, you know, faster, better, heavier, whatever. But the basic requirements are going to be the same. And I knew they were going to be the same halfway through the meeting when it was quite clear they didn't really want to get rid of the old platform. Their objective was to have a bunch of requirements that so closely matched their current platform that their current platform would be extended, not replaced. And the decisions that they were informing and trying to make absolutely impacted themselves. Okay. So um, they understood their own risk preference. They just wanted to keep things the same. Okay, so you give, you give, you know, and what do I mean by risk profile is advantageous to you? Well, who's going to suffer the consequences of the decision? What is the decision you want? And what's the risk profile of the individuals in your group? Those three things will decide who you give speaking uh, a preference to. And you do that by having what's called billets in your game. Your game has roles, okay? And you allocate individuals to roles. Well, that's up to you as the game designer. Who's going to be in charge of the cell? Who's going to be in charge of the staff, etc. cetera? Uh, good games, you have the senior officer who's been invited to lead the cell. He sets up his own internal game structure. So watch out for uh, an overly constructed game cell. You know some uh, manipulations going on right there. That brings me on to part of the blue move. Um, you do not invite a senior officer to lead your games to any of the game cells. You recruit a senior officer to lead your game cell. And the difference is the following. You go to the senior officer, tell him about the game, ask him, are you willing, sir, to lead this game cell through playing the game as designed? That's very different from saying, here's this game, will you come and lead the cell? If you do the latter, you get what I've seen. Halfway through the game, the two star, retired two star, decides that he would much rather be playing a different game. And unless the game facilitator has the intestinal fortitude to face him down, uh, you've got a problem. Okay. At the you recruit and you do it early because the guy is senior, he's an expert, that's why you're going to him. The guy or gal may very well have interesting ideas, but at some point, the idea, good idea fairy needs to be shot. And uh, it's a recruitment, you know, to lead the cell, lead the cell into playing the game as designed. And here is the design, sir. Okay. Um, so anyway, how do you, how do you uh, handle the risky shift? Back again. Okay. Subgroups of no more than eight. Put a good risk neutral leader in charge, named, responsible, and accountable for the outcome. Hold them accountable. Um, emphasize the need for risk neutrality. Don't overemphasize the probabilities. Don't overemphasize the uh, payoff or the damage. Okay. I'm now going to come on to something that is really quite fascinating that only just came across recently and uh, based on discussions inside the uh, wargaming community is uh, a hot topic. And that is gender ratios gender ratios. Okay, this is based on conversations I've had with uh, facilitators dating back 30 years, and also conversations with uh, research professors into gender studies. Before you roll your eyes, uh, particular ones I'm thinking about, also are consultants for US Special Forces, and are brutally hard-nosed and clear-eyed about the topics and are female professors um, and uh, postings and conversations uh, listened to at third hand with um, Sally Davis in the UK. So, oh yes, and literature. Um, the Silent Sex is an interesting and a very useful book to read on this subject. 
You can manipulate a group by manipulating the gender ratio inside the group. This gets to be a bit hard when there are so few female wargamers. But if you have a number of female wargamers, um, you can be quite cunning here. Remember, I'm now descri describing this from the malign point of view. First of all, some numbers. It's the tendency, again, it's a tendency. When women make up less than a third of the group, and I'm talking about small subgroups here, they tend not to push their points of view. They tend not to stand up for themselves. When they make up more than a third, but less than a half, actually, when they make up more than a third, I can stop there. When they make up more than a third, they push their points of view. Ah, that's right. When they make up more than a third, but less than a half, yes, they push their points of view. More than a third, they push their points of view. But if they make up less than a half of the group, the males present tend not to listen. Okay. When they make up more than half the group, they push their points of view because they are more than a third. And because they're more than a half, the males present tend to listen. These are tendencies only. And of course, talking is not the same as being listened to. I sincerely hope I'm being listened to. All I can hear is myself talking. So the malign moves are as follows. Okay. You put the males with whose opinions you do not agree into subgroups with the women making up more than one third, but less than one half of the group. When you have a subgroup, where the women make up more than a third, but less than a half, they tend to be assertive and the men tend not to listen. It's a recipe for a dysfunctional group. So you create this, deliberately create dysfunctional groups and put people you're not interested in hearing their opinions into that group. You know that the females do agree with your opinions. And that's especially, uh, you, you, you've got an interesting decision to make. Do you put them in that group? and have the, you know, you lose their efficacy elsewhere, but you certainly uh, disrupt the males whose opinions you don't agree with. Okay, the other malign move is you put with the women with whose opinions you do agree into subgroups with males with whose opinions you do not agree, such that the women are in the majority. Okay, now, mostly we have a problem with uh, the malign player has a problem because there are so few uh, women in wargaming, at least at the sort of prof levels uh, that I've been playing in. Um, I know that Sebastian and uh, Goose and uh, Rex Brynan, and there are other areas where there are women being brought along. Uh, not enough. Uh, we need more. Um, but uh, there's a danger here when you get more of them of not being aware of this ability to manipulate the gender ratios. Um, there is the obvious inadvertent danger of saying, I'm going to be terribly uh, inclusive. I've uh, got um, five women and I've got in my uh, big, uh, big group here and I'm going to divide the group up into five uh, subgroups and put a woman in each subgroup. Guaranteed you've just disenfranchised the women in the group. You're better off putting those five women on their own in a group and then paying attention to what they have to say. But the tendency to spread everyone around, to spread the goodness, uh, will do absolutely the opposite. Okay. So if you can, the blue move, if you can, is you take the females present and if you've got enough of them, you put them, you spread them around. So in as many groups, subgroups as possible in which they're in the majority. And if that's not possible, at least in one subgroup in which they're the majority. And if there aren't eight or five women, you've only got, say, three, you manipulate the sizes of the other groups so that you have a small number left over. And oh, gosh, that's the one with the majority of women in it. OK, we're coming to the end here. OK, so just a summary on the left hand side, there's a list of group dynamics that you should all be familiar with and make use of for good and watch out for it being done for evil. 
Um, on the left is the threat, intellectual fraud driven by career risk, hard to repeat any experiment, and overconfidence of senior leaders. Um, why is this cause a problem? It's our, our war, as war gamers, lack of ethics, competence, and courage. Okay. What is to be done? Okay. You need deep knowledge. Okay. It's no good just understanding game mechanics, being a facilitator, understanding how to put a game together. Uh, that's the inner game. How, the inner, it doesn't matter how good the inner game is if you've been defeated already in the outer game. If you're not playing the outer game, you have, you know, the inner game is a, is a wash, basically. So if you're the sponsor, and one day you might be, you've got to do the, what's on the left. You've got to understand yourself and your staff's vulnerability to intellectual fraud, understand your motivations, the, any conflicts of interest you might have. Watch out for your own people doing red moves. Require the game is peer reviewed in some sense. Okay, and watch, keep your beady little eye on the game designer. But if you're the game designer and education, educators, war game educators here, pay attention. Deep knowledge of group pathologies. Okay, engage the sponsor. The sponsor, not just the staff. Don't be put off by the staff with a, you know, absent, an absent sponsor. He'll, the sponsor will roll in after the game's been designed with all sorts of changes because he hasn't been informed properly. And engage him in objectives analysis. What do you want? Why do you want it? And it's a drill down, a five-stage drill down. And why do you want it? For each answer, you ask, well, why do you want that? And you keep going down about five levels. Um, why don't you have it is a very interesting question to drill down on. And then how long you're in your current position, sir, because that tells you how long you've got to actually do the game, do the analysis, write the report, brief him or her. All of that has to happen before that person rotates out. You recruit your senior leaders and you have to have the moral courage to face down to your superiors when they start trying to manipulate the game over your head and you must be open to peer review. Um, that's tough, really. So at this point, this point, let's open it up to discussion, turn on all the videos so I can see some faces. It doesn't feel like I'm talking into a, uh, into a toilet. And uh, let me pull up my uh, video screen here. You need to turn me on, Ed. My uh, video is uh, up. Thank you. So anything in chat that needs to be addressed, Ed, or shall we just uh, let people uh, turn on their microphones or, or raise their hands and you turn on their mics? What would you like to do? Um, <clears throat> two things. One, there is one question remaining. And then two, I would still prefer um, that questions remain in chat. There's some certain legal stuff that I just don't have the answers for about our ability to record uh, individual awesome. spaces and stuff uh, related to Georgetown rules and regulations that I just don't have the answer for. So please continue to post questions in chat, uh, but we'd still have one remaining outlier, which is how do we best measure or demonstrate the impact of game outcomes on decision making? And then how would we then backtrack some of the potential impact of malign efforts on those decisions? Yeah, um, you know what? I, I could make something up, but I'm not. Sh I'm not altogether sure. Uh, I guess what you have to do is actually track the decision. You have to have a relationship with the. Uh, if it's a tight, tight loop, you have a sponsor. He, uh, you, you've talked to the sponsor about why they want. You know, what do you want? Well, I want this game about. Well, why? In that conversation, you'll get an understanding. And, and you explain it to the sponsor. You, you have, you're, you're not just going to read this report secretly under the bedclothes with a flashlight, are you? You, you, you? you want the game report, the game outcome for a reason. You know, help us help you ensure that what you get supports you. So you find out, you know, about what is the decision? Who is that person reporting to? What are they actually uh, addressing? And you have the conversation after you've delivered the game report and briefed the decision maker about how to continue supporting his or her 
uh, promotion of those results up his or her chain of command. Uh, I, I see no other way than doing that. From educational point of view, I mean, I know at the War College, they survey graduates about, you know, um, they look at their data, their promotion, et cetera. And then they also survey them what was useful, what wasn't, why was it useful, uh, et cetera. So for education, you're after the efficacy of gaming as an educational technique to lectures as an educational technique. And uh, if you're pro proposing gaming uh, or you're using gaming, um, you should have that data collection plan in place. I've heard it said that uh, at some of the colleges, um, they they taught a they they taught a course and then they uh, had other students do a game about the course, and uh, then they had the professors who taught the course exa by examination test everybody and decide that teaching the course gave them better results than gaming. Well, of course, they were the guys who set the exam <laughs> and uh, did the assessment. Conflict of interest right there. Uh, but I think for analytic games, if it's you, you need a relationship with the sponsor in order to help the sponsor uh, make best use of the game results. Next question, sir. Uh, is there any knowledge management, which is to say archiving or information management, where you, how you store and collect and understand and manage that data, techniques that help archive different views on commonly understood data that are favored in certain information captures for subsequent war game analysis? Well, I, I know there's the, um, what is it, the war game repository. Uh, that was, you know, I think it's still only available through uh, classified um, uh, card access. That sort of collected information about games. Um, how I have different views and commonly understood data. I'm unaware of any um, other than the the uh, war game repository. I think if you do a Google search on war game repository, you, know, you might get some access to it. Or email uh, Peter Pellegrino and ask him how to get access to it. If you don't have a cat card, forget it. I, I interpreted the question that was presented as, I think they were asking if you have any advice to help. Like basically, oh. how can you structure and manage your own data collection of your iterations of wargaming in order to facilitate your ability to potentially identify or kind of, you know, separate some of these malign actors or malign ideas. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's like an intelligence question, isn't it? So you document your uh, design process from the get go. And at each stage, you document the information you've gained and you you document as you go through. And I'm talking about the kind of games where you, you've got weeks to months to design it. I'm not talking about, you know, put together a game tomorrow because the you know the brigade is going to attack on saturday um you document that stuff and you document and you you ask yourself the question you know what was was something done here deliberately malignly or you know incompetently um, and you pay attention uh to who's saying what to whom i was i sat and listened because the two-star general uh, from a service who will remain uh, anonymous. He hustled the people from his service on from both red and blue uh, cells into a room. And he didn't hear me behind the bank of computers where I was busy tapping away, um, coding the uh, game, game net um, functionality. I mean, I wasn't deliberately eavesdropping. He was the guy that walked into my office and started talking. And he basically told them, OK, ignore the military objectives internal to the game. Only make decisions that support our, our services uh, preferred solution and that damage the other services preferred solution. OK, so, uh, OK, that's very interesting. I noted that down. Uh, didn't bother 
you know, we're not going to uh, challenge him on it or anything. We just configured the uh, plenary sessions and the facilitation uh, to challenge, we looked out for and then challenged in facilitation, the uh, apparent decisions and arguments being made that were biased uh, in support of, we, so we directly addressed not the attempts at dishonesty and malignity, but we deliberately we directly addressed individuals in the game who are attempting to act. If they're on the blue cell, their proposals were apparently um, not very good for blues, and we challenged that. And in fact, that turned it around, because once you start pointing out what's bad about a particular blue move, people go in the other direction. So the two cells, I call them red, you know, there were sort of two blue cells and one red cell. Blue one addressed, you know, service one's preferred and had a mixture of service people present. Blue two addressed service two's uh, preferred alternative and had a mixture of service one and service two present and red provided a common red. Not the design I'd have done, but there you go. Um, so you, you keep track and you have a kind of nasty, suspicious mind like I do. Where's the conflict of interest? Okay. What's really going on? You, you become paranoid. Okay. Just because uh, no one's, you know, what is it? Just because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not out to get you. Uh, what, what don't you understand about the situation you're dealing with? Always keep that question in mind and always keep trying to understand it. Okay, it's um, there is no sort of wargaming repository that's going to help you here. You have to understand these human psychology, group dynamics, and you know your own organizations and institutions' conflicts of interest. Yes, sir. Thank you. Moving on to the next question: When designing war games to support analysis and future decision-making in particularly very high risk courses of action, how can a team be made that is basically more aware and then potentially inculcated, this is kind of two questions, season to one, inculcated against you know, the, the potential malign influence in actions? Well, the first uh, line of defense is precisely what I've mentioned, just be aware of, uh what's going on and engage in blue moves and ensure that there are no red moves uh, having taken place. Um, very high risk, high you know, potential payoff or damage. If you get it wrong, you make clear to people that that's what it is and that the consequences of getting wrong will be real lives, uh, real people. Uh, and you, have that, you, you literally have that discussion with the people. But nevertheless, we have to have a game or make a decision or have a break, whatever is the process you're going through, uh, because we need recommendations or answers or insights or whatever is the objective of the game about this situation. You directly address it with them. You could also um, directly address the probabilities and the actual payoffs. If your process is one in, uh, there's a whole topic in analysis called preference reversal. You can, rever uh, you, there's, you can in general reverse people's preference ordering of the two alternatives by the order in which you present them the same information, but you present it in a different order. You can also manipulate people's preferences by presenting the alternatives in uh, by describing their payoffs and not their uh, 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 rather than their um, uh, the, what you have to pay their costs or describing them in terms of costs rather than uh, benefits or changing the order in which you describe the costs and the benefits and so. I would tend to not just have one war game. I would have a war game that emphasized benefits and a war game that emphasized costs, and then have a uh, conference about the results from both. Think about a court case. You have 
the prosecutor who's going all out to present the worst possible case for a course of action, the course of action being, uh, you know, uh, letting this guy go. He's going all out for presenting, the, you know, the, the, the prosecution. This guy is guilty. Here's why. Uh, here are all the circumstances that make his crime even more egregious, etc. The defense goes in, tries to pick that apart, and tries to provide the best possible uh, interpretation of what's going on. So, and then the judge acts almost like a, uh, he's like a balancing act, the ju judge and, and or jury. So you almost want two war games, at least if you have a very, you know, not, I don't want to go into harm's way based on a single war game, frankly. Um, you know, but with very high payoff, high risk, high uh, cost, if you get it wrong, situations, more than one war game. And I would tend to tilt one war game towards, you know, all, what's, what, what are all the good things about a particular color? Uh, how, you know, if everything goes well, because if things go well, you want to be in a position to take advantage. And another war game, what are all the bad, what's the alternative? What are the bad things about this? How can things go wrong? Um, what can we do to mitigate if they do go wrong? And as Peter Perler always points out, it's not just wargaming. Wargaming, analysis, field tests, but in the absence of field tests, wargaming and other analytic techniques in, uh, in, in coordination. Yes, sir. There is another question. Um, the asker recalled something during the presentation that was of uh, the virtuous person with capital V, capital P. Uh, a right act is the action a virtuous person person would do in the same circumstance. When you were acting as an adjudicator, uh, what are the risks of potentially overly limiting circumstances of a war game? Adjudicator, right. So here's my uh, interpretation of the adjudicator role. So let's, if you're in an educational, it all depends on it goes back to what's the sponsor's objectives for the game, okay? If you say doing an educational game and you there's a lesson you want to teach and the game is going off in a completely different direction, the adjudicator's role is to, uh, in is to um, guide the game back on the tracks. That's also actually true of an analytic game, but, but for different reasons. The adjudicator, in my view, takes the red move and the blue move and decides what's the outcome of that. Now, there are different levels uh, for purely tactical games with well understood weapon systems, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the adjudicator is more like a referee. You have combat results tables or simulations that are running and uh, the adjudicator is more like a referee who makes sure that people aren't cheating in some sense. Uh, so, you know, at one level, you've got the game rigidly adjudicated by combat results tables. You roll dice. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, say with a novel situation, you don't actually know what might happen. Um, you've only got sort of expert judgment. And an example is, how do we, how would you war game US information operations during theater nuclear war between India and Pakistan with China getting involved? And your information op is to try and dampen down that war and get, keep China out. What's your combat results table? How many of those such situations have you actually seen in the real world? Zero. Uh, you've got experts in different facets of that situation. Some you put in the on the red team, some you put on the blue team, some you put on the China team, some you put in the adjudication team, some you put in the US team. And basically, uh, the, the adjudicators, you know, where are the experts? The adjudicators are actually players as well, um, because they're making decisions about what's the outcome of different actions. And they're guided by the sponsor. What does a sponsor want to get out of this game? Slightly less complicated. 
we have a game say in which uh, we're invading a uh, we're, we're protecting a small island off a large uh, mainland and we want to know this and then the sponsor wants to know say hypothetically how would you fight if one of your major assets uh, got uh, taken out of the fight completely near the beginning of the fight how would you fight so you have the game um, I can guarantee what one of the outcomes is going to be in move one when red fires a ship busting missile at that uh, platform um, it, it's going to go down okay as long as the probability of it going down is not zero and that you can make a credible argument about how it why it did go down no amount of arm waving and complaining by blue okay the ship went down sir what are you going to do about it um, if you want to know you know how do we deter if you want to game deterrence how do we deter a nuclear strike by the enemy and the enemy tries to hit you with a nuclear strike on move one before you've had a chance to do any deterring. Either your game has been badly designed, but if it hasn't, your adjudicator steps in. There was a misfire in your missile, sir. Or no, you're not going to do that. So the adjudicator constrains by selecting the outcomes of red versus blue interactions at one level, advising uh, players about, you know, what, is or aren't legal moves uh, at, at another level but is guided by the sponsor the game has to provide value to the sponsor if it's going if if just rolling a dice on a combat results table gives you an answer that takes the game down a trajectory that's not useful for the player for the sponsor rolling the dice is the deductive game an inductive game design is the adjudicator looks at the combat results table, ascertains that the outcome that would be more useful for the sponsor does not have a zero probability, but has a reasonable one, doesn't bother rolling dice, just tells the players that's the outcome. He constrains it. The adjudicator in inductive games where you want to keep the game on track to provide useful information for the sponsor, the adjudicator is a game player. He's an uber player. If you take seriously Peter Perler's definition of a game is between players who make decisions that matter, what's the adjudicator doing? He's making decisions. Do they matter? Well, yes, they do. The adjudicator, she's a player. But understanding ground truth, coming up with actual outcomes, means she's an uber player. So yeah, the adjudicator is a is a highly um, skilled role, uh, and you can get it wrong. You adjudicate badly, uh, the game goes off the rails, players get demoralized. Um, it's nothing worse than the kind of game which is nothing more than a sequence of vignettes where it doesn't matter what they do in vignette one, you roll into vignette two and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter what you've done in the previous sort of move. Just a sequence of vignettes with disconnected. That's the height of uh, control. Um, that's just a bunch of questions with what would you do if. Okay, I've ranted enough on that topic. Go read my paper on the uh, adjudication, the Diab Diabolos in Machina of Wargaming. That answers that question in detail. Yes, sir. Thank you. That's actually the end of all the questions we've had. Ah, okay. I can go and have a gin and tonic. Is that what you're telling me? Yes, sir. You can. And so, uh, oh, actually, we just got a question. Do you have a link to your paper? Uh, yes. Go to the U.S. Naval War College. Uh, go to the, um, well, actually, you know what? If you've got a few seconds, what I will do, if I can do it quickly enough, is just post the link into chat. How about I do that? Um, Let's see, let's see if I can do this quickly. Uh, da -da -de -do -de. Publications. Let's see, is it there? Yes. Chat, okay, let's see. Um, let's see. 
we can send it to everybody. It's a shared Google Doc, so um, just click on that and tell me if you don't see it. Someone tells me if they do see it, if they're interested. Um, uh, the link's good, sir. That link's good. And let me give you the other one, um, which is all about dealing with your boss, your senior players, and your sponsor. I think that's a yeah. Just check that one. So, at the um, good to go, sir. Good to go. So the other one, the uh, Diabolus paper. I thought that was clever. Instead of Deus in Machina, it was Diabolus ex Machina. Um, it's a, it's a strained analogy, but it uh, it works. Okay. So if you go to the Diabolus paper, um, make sure you go past the end notes. Uh, because the online version, not the print version, the online version has my uh, chart, my brainstorm uh, chart, um, which is how I tend to think about topics uh, as a page tacked onto the end of the online version. So there you go. Some of, oh, excellent. Some of you classic scholars got it. Exactly, exactly. The glories of a classical education. Um, yeah, that's why my three witches, uh, that's why the... Uh, the uh, second paper is, has uh, Shakespeare in it. So there you go. Yes, sir. On behalf of the Georgetown University Wargaming Society, I'd really like to say thank you so much for coming out. It was a fantastic presentation. Thank you to everyone who posted excellent questions in the chat. Tried to work through all of them, and I think we got a lot of good work here. So just thank you again, and we appreciate your time.